Heavenly Father, what great grace you've given us to be able to come to you and talk to you. It is miraculous that we can have conversations with the living God. We may call it prayer, but truly it is the creature speaking with intimacy with the creator. How wonderful it is that we can talk to you. How are we even allowed for you to be mindful of us? This is a grace on our lives. We come this afternoon with a sensitivity knowing that you have kept us throughout this year. Every Monday that we've come to, we may think of with drudgery because of work, but every Monday has been a miracle by your hand. Every job that you've given us has been by your hand. The things that we have been burdened by still are a blessing because we have them. The places that we sleep, the food that we eat, all by your grace and your grace alone. Human initiative has not gotten us to where we are. Certainly it is by your grace. And so because we trust that he who began a good work in us will complete it, we ask you today, Holy Spirit, you know where each of us is uniquely at. That's the truth. All of us are at unique stations in life, spiritually, emotionally, and socially. But because the Spirit of God has the mind of Christ, we come here today expecting you to speak a word for our unique station and location in life. And so when we walk away from this place, we know that you have spoken. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you all. We continue on in the book of Acts as we have gnats and flies attacking me. Um, today, we're going to talk about Acts chapter 5 um, and what God was doing amongst the apostles and believers. Uh, when I was a little boy, um, I, I'm a preacher's kid, so I was in church all the time. And when I was a little boy, I would go to different sermons or different uh, churches with my dad when he would preach. And when I would go there, um, you know, I didn't know anybody. I would just be with my pops. And one day I had an excruciating headache. So I sat in the back and I started crying. And as I started crying, one of the ushers saw me. And sweet woman, she said, come, come to the back. So she brings me to the back area. And when we went to the back, I had full expectation that I was going to get some Advil, some orange juice, potentially some ginger ale, because we know that ginger ale heals everything, praise God. And um, she did not do any of those things. She got a wet rag, put it over my head, then got some anointing oil, and then she started to pray. And I'm telling you, this woman prayed the lights down. She prayed with passion and precision. She prayed with intensity. And while she was praying, don't you know that that headache went away? I was like, wow. I did not come up in that. Our church didn't do nothing like that. We prayed, but we did not pray about headaches. In fact, we never really talked about miracles. We knew that God was a miracle worker, but we never really talked about miracles in our day. So here's what was amazing in that moment. My headache goes away, and she asks me, she says, do you still have your headache? Now, I think because I was nervous, and to be honest with you, I was a little weirded out, I said, yes, I still have my headache. And do you know what this woman did? She goes, you shouldn't. I was like, oh. <laughs> she said, I prayed in Jesus' name. I was like, wow. So she got back to praying, got some more anointing oil out, just kept praying down the lights. Now, here's what blew me away about that moment. It wasn't the fact that she prayed away my headache. It's the fact that she expected it. And I believe that when the Bible says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power, that as people of God, we do not and are not expected enough of miracles. We believe miracles are for televangelists. 
We believe miracles are for this most sensational group of people. We believe miracles are when you get loud. Miracles are for certain parts of the earth. Miracles are for a certain particular type of person. But I believe and I want you to walk away with an expectancy of trusting God for the miraculous. Amen? So would you say that with me? Expect miracles. Expect miracles. We should be the people of God with the power of God to expect miracles. In the book of Acts, what we see is miracles happening. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Um, after we saw Ananias and Sapphira, so if you remember the sermon from last week, they, they didn't give the full portion of their money. They end up dropping dead. It's an amazing moment. It says all came over the, over church, uh, uh, over the church. And then in verse 12, right after that, it says after this all came over the church, verse 12 says, now many signs and wonders were regularly done. Regular, it was regular. It happened all the time. Amongst the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. That's another way that could be translated as Solomon's porch. It was this grand area, like, a, like an area where everyone would come to. So it would almost be like saying they were doing miracles at Fulton Mall. It was a gathering place of people that people would descend to. So they weren't doing miracles in a place that was hidden or unseen. They were doing miracles where everyone could see it. So because of that, when you jump down to verse 15, here's what happened. Verse 15 says, as a result... People brought their sick into the streets, as you would, and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. And then look at this last part. And all of them were healed. They were all healed. People being tormented, people with all types of ailment. They're bringing their, their sick people out of the street all so that the apostles could heal them. The Bible goes on, says that in, in Acts 3, Peter heals a lame man. In Acts 4, Peter raises Tabitha back to life, raises her from the dead. Paul, it says, he heals a cripple. Paul casts out a spirit of divination. Angels open up doors in the Bible. They open up prison doors. This all happens right before us in the word of God. It happens in such a way that it was a regular thing. Paul, the apostle, would say it this way in, that, in Romans 15. He said, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Meaning he's saying, I'm going to preach and we're going to see other things from my preaching, the deed. He goes on to say in verse 19, by the powers of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So he saw signs and wonders as a regular thing to accompany the word of God. He says, so that, the, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. So Paul saw signs and wonders as a legitimate way to confirm the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 6, 8. Now, I'm building up a little of, a, of a apologetic here. I'm going to break this down in just for a second uh, for some of you that are worried. I can see the worry in your face. Praise God. Acts 6, 8. And Stephen, 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 who was not an apostle. Stephen, it says, Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing what? Great signs and wonders amongst the people. So it's speaking of Philip. These are not apostles. Speaking of Philip. Acts 5, 8, 5, and 6. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what? To what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him, they saw the signs that he did. So it shows us it's not just the apostles. It's also those that the apostles brought to faith. Lastly, it is not just Jesus that performs miracles. Luke chapter 10, verse 8 and 9 says, whenever you, he's talking to the disciples, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So when you look in the book of Acts and when you look in the Gospels, apostles are doing miracles, disciples are doing miracles, signs and wonders. The Bible goes on to even say that the miraculous 
is a part of our gift mix. The Bible goes on to say that in verse 9, to another, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9, to another, faith by the same spirit, to another, gifts of healing by one spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish spirits, the other, tongues, to another, interpretation of tongues. So miracles are even listed as a gift. Miracles in the Bible are spectacular. Jesus walking on water, Jesus feeding the 5,000, people being raised from the dead. And so oftentimes the church doesn't talk about biblical miracles because they think all miracles need to look like they were done in the Bible. So we want to see people. So let's forget the fact that there is no healthcare system here, okay? There is no government assistance here, okay? If you were going to get fed, Jesus was feeding people. If a leper was going to get healed, Jesus was going to be the one to do it. Jesus, therefore, is showing the miraculous power of God to put the power of God on display because these are people who are powerless and have no other power source. So there is no need for us to presume that we need to say, see the same kind of miracles with the same kind of intensity and the same kind of proclivity in the Bible, what miracles essentially are is when God begins to show off and say, I am the one that is holding all things together. It is when God begins to make clear my power is the one that gives life and health and vitality. My power is the one that actually holds life Together, Max Turner would say it this way. It is an extraordinary, a miracle is an extraordinary, startling, observable event. It cannot reasonably be explained in terms of human abilities or other known forces in the world. It is perceived as a direct act of God. And it is usually understood having symbolic, having had to have symbolic uh, or sign value. Okay i.e. pointing to God as redeemer and judge. In other words, God is going to do something, and after having it done, not only is he going to reveal that it was him that did it, but he's showing an element of his character. If he heals, we realize he is a healer. We first see signs and wonders in the book of Exodus, the first time the phrase is even used. In the book of Exodus, chapter 7, The verse says, Moses is about to try to set the people free. But God says, well, you're not going to be able to set them free in your own power. So he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Pharaoh didn't listen, but the Egyptians and the Jews amongst Jerusalem, amongst Egypt, Listen, because they said God was at work. And so what did God do? He allowed Moses to go in there and we saw plagues turning water into blood and frogs and lice and flies. You can read all this in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 8. So miracles are when God is getting man's attention on him so that they become aware he is the one who is actually in, in control. God don't have to do miracles. The feeding of the 5,000, if you know that story where Jesus takes the bread from a little boy and he breaks it up and then he multiplies it for 5,000 people, the Bible says 5,000 men, so there's probably 10,000 people there. Couldn't he have done that a whole bunch of different ways? Jesus could have had fish, they could have just came upon a sea and fish come out the water or they could have, I don't know, gone into a deli. Who knows what could have happened? What I'm saying is Jesus did not have to feed the 5,000 in the dynamic way he did it. What he was doing was he was putting himself on display. I'm of the Gen X generation, praise God. And one of, my, uh, one of the things I enjoy about uh, the millennial genre of uh, person, y'all do a great job of telling the world what you're doing. I don't be thinking about it. I'll be hanging out with some millennials or the Gen Z community, and uh, we'll be out to eat for lunch. And all of a sudden, they're taking pictures. I'm like, why are you taking pictures of something you're going to eat? And they're like, well, we should tell everybody. I'm like, we should tell everybody. This is a good 
burger. You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden they post it and they were like, I was at this place eating and it was amazing. And they tell the world what they do in private. And I'm like, I'm just not good at that. I don't be thinking about pictures. I be thinking about eating, okay? Some people have a natural propensity to post everything. I'm not shading you today. I just want you to know, I praise God for you. God does not post his power all the time. Miracles are when he posts up his power. He's holding your health together right now. Did you know that? A miracle, a a miracle is when you say, well, God, you got to do it. He's like, well, I've been doing it. But you now have the recognition of my power. And so miracles do not have to have the same dynamic uh, means and power and display of feeding 5,000 or walking on water. In fact, I would say the more aware we become of his presence, we will see miniature miracles in our daily life because if you know God long enough, you'll say, that was him. And no one saw him levitate. No one saw flies in the sky. But you will say that was him. And it is when God will put himself on display, when he posts his power. And so my my desire, I think too often as believers, we try to make God just regular. He is not. He is all powerful. He will take you beyond your imagination, beyond your categories. You cannot box him in. He is way beyond your plan and your imagination. God is greater and grander and more powerful. And so when we talk about miracles, you should have an expectancy that God can do anything. Too much we're basing on our own, our own mental strength and our own plans and our own power and our resume and our networking. We put too much on ourselves and too much pressure on ourselves creates a great deal of anxiety in your life. And so when you can put everything at the feet of Jesus as a, as a way of life and as a way of thinking, miracles are the outcome, the natural outcome of a supernatural dependence on God. Knowing, I know God can do it. I know God can do it. I trust God can do it. And so all men may say no. Wait to see what God has to say. And so my heartbeat in this message is for you to increase your expectancy for miracles. So I have four ways that I want to talk about before we get out of here. Four ways to expect miracles. My hope in the beginning of this message was to give somewhat of an apologetic to say, miracles happen for the apostles, miracles happen in the Old Testament, miracles happen in Acts. We should have the same expectancy, even though they may not have the same intensity. God operates through the miraculous, amen? So the first, the first point here has two sub points. So 1A, you could say, don't base your faith in signs and wonders, amen? Don't base your faith in signs and wonders. Mark 13, 22, this is, a, this is a crazy verse. It says, for false Christs and false prophets will, that's prophetic, will arise, and guess what they're going to do? They're going to perform signs and wonders. To lead what? To lead people astray. Even who? The elect. That means Jesus said there will be people who will be pimping the same kind of power I have and lead my people astray because people have their faith not in Jesus but in the power of Jesus. And so we have to be very careful of trusting in the supernatural because holy things are not just regulated through the supernatural. Evil things can do supernatural things too. You better stop playing with that Ouija board. You see, you think you're playing. You think, why do they sell it in a toy store? I don't know why. That thing is evil. If you want want to start seeing supernatural things, you don't only need to pray to Jesus. And so this is, and, and what the Bible says is, there is coming a time when people are going to be impressed with power. There will be prophets raised up, false Christs raised up. 
That's why you have to be very careful with just saying, well, I saw this person. They're a great communicator. They're a great thinker. They know all these things. Or look at all the things they do. A heart for Christ is not just impressive. It is submissive. A person can do things like Jesus but not be following Jesus. I pray we do not depend on impressive people. Rather, we look to see who has a heart for Christ, to follow Jesus, and a heart for obedience. You know, I don't have time as the clock keeps ticking. I, I fear because of the advent of so many impressive people online. I fear we are not taking enough time to personally encounter God. Sermons are the echo of the word of God. But I don't want the remix. I want the original, I want God to talk to me. My fear is too many of us are scrolling and not reading. Too many of us are hearing great pithy statements online but we don't have a deep enough prayer life. Every sermon is, you know, you know how they always say the book is better than the movie? Every sermon is like the movie. It's a, it's a take on the text. But the book is always better than the sermon. And we have to start regulating time because the more that you begin to have a heart for the word of God and you have regular time with Jesus, you will start scrolling and be like, mm, that sounds good, but it ain't right. Yes. I mean, it made me laugh, but it don't make me holy. It's entertaining, but it's not edifying. And I'm saying the, the social media is not meant to sanctify you. It's meant to entertain you. Know that not every word will make it online because not every word is about repentance. A lot of these words that you, sorry, a lot of the word that you're seeing online is about you getting a business in your life. It's meant to inspire you, but it's not talking about repentance. It's not talking about having a crucified spirit and submitting and, and a Calvary road. The, the Calvary road ain't going to make it on your timeline. So you have to begin to dig into the word. This is why we create community together. So we dig in the word together. This is why we have Bible study and growth groups and why we have people praying for you after so that you have the word of God and the prayer in your life so that you would have a mind of Christ and that you would not be led astray. Led astray is what he said. Even the elect. Secondly, in not basing your faith on signs and wonders, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 4. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. He says, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Now, if you know the story, that's pretty cold, right? If you, if you know the story of Jonah, Jonah goes into the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. Jesus then points to the story of Jonah, and he's essentially saying, just like Jonah was in the belly of a, a fish, actually, for three days and three nights, I, essentially, will be in the grave for three days and three nights. And what he's saying is, the greatest sign and wonder is the transformative power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's saying, that's the greatest miracle of all time. And he says, if you need more miracles than that miracle, then I can't impress you. Some people want to be entertained into faith. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to entertain you to transform you. If you cannot trust in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, I am not going to keep doing little miracles and you miss the big miracle. In fact, I would say that the miracle of the resurrection opens you up to the belief of all kinds of miracles. Think for a second, how did you believe? No, it wasn't your mom and dad. No, it wasn't the church. No, it wasn't just the Bible. No, it wasn't just worship. You believe because miraculously God got your attention. You know all the things you could be doing right now. If you really know the gospel, and if you really know your own testimony, you will look in the mirror, you will look in the mirror and say, I am a miracle. My belief in Jesus is miraculous. How do we believe in a man we've never seen? 
How do we trust in the resurrection we were not at? In a world filled with evidence, we only have faith, and the faith is our evidence. And you say, well, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? You say, I know. (laughs) I just know. I trust. And you have the word to confirm. God miraculously changed you. And so if you trust in that miracle, it opens you up to all miracles. If you believe that God can raise a man from the dead, what can't God do? You say, I have a dead marriage. Well, if he can raise Jesus from the dead, he can raise a dead marriage. You say, my career is dead. Well, if he can raise a man from the dead, he can resurrect your career. What can't God do if he can raise a man from the dead? If he can change you from where you were to where you are now, what can't God do if he can transform? So what what Jesus says is, no, I'm sorry. They want more miracles before they believe, but they need to believe in the primary miracle, the miracle of me dying and coming back from the dead. (laughs) Secondly, uh, so that was 1A, 1B, praise God, (laughs) for for my note takers. Number two, believe that God is active in the mundane and in miracles. The mundane would mean routine, basic, regular things in life. Look what it says in Psalm 104, verses 14 and 15. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the hearts of man. He says, if we eaten good, it was because of the Lord. If the, but he's even saying, if the livestock ate... It's because of the Lord. He says, if we're drinking wine, it's because of the Lord. And the oil to make his face shine. You know, if you're looking good and you're getting glossy and putting on makeup, he says, it's because of the Lord. (laughs) He says, and he shine his face and bread to strengthen man's heart. He's saying that them red lobster biscuits are from the Lord. (laughs) And they are from the Lord. They are. You put yourself in a dangerous position when you only relegate God to the big things and you cannot see him in the little little things. You say, man, I remember when God got me out that situation. That was a miracle. But when you know him enough, you'll know that Monday is a miracle. That the fact that he gave you breath in your lungs is a miracle. When life is boring, God is so deeply in control. Some of y'all don't even have a boring life. Some of y'all are like, I want to go back to the boring times. <laughs> Some of us are like, well, are there, are there other versions of the Christian life? I feel like I'm in the adventure edition. <laughs> like, uh, is there a different one? No, 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 no. If things are, are regulated, it's because there's a regulator. God is keeping things in control. Colossians says he holds all things together. So, so before you start expecting miracles and define them as big things, see God in little things. When we, were, when we were married, when we first got married, I had you know, gotten this job, and I remember, I remember when my wife was making $30,000 a year, we were like, yo, we are paid, okay? Okay, who knows, well, what do you do with 30K? So we, I remember that. And then I remember that, I, I, I know what it's like to have a, not a number in my account, but a net, or like a little line, a little line in front of it. You know what I'm talking about? In the red. I, I know what that's like to be negative $100. So when we, got, we started getting resources, I remember when we bought our first table in our first house, in our kitchen. Boy, I remember I just looked at that table and I said, thank you, Lord. I can't believe we have a house. I can't believe we have a table. I know what it's like to ask you for little things. And I don't think my networking got me those little things. I believe you are the God of little things. So you must see him in the mundane. You must see him in the regular. C.S. Lewis says it this way, miracles are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. C.S. Lewis is essentially saying he is just, he pairs down his power just for us to be able to recognize him. 
Thirdly, miracles aren't meant to be impressive. They're meant to be restorative in moments of crisis. God delivers his people out of slavery, so he does all the plagues. Uh, He multiplies food so people can eat. Uh, He makes the blind see. He allows the deaf to hear. He brings people back from the dead. He takes brokenness out of this world and he heals it. And remember what I said, there's, there is no health care. There is no government assistance. So he's doing all these things to restore people back to who they originally were intended to be. Miracles, therefore, there, there's, there's, for the majority of miracles you see in the Bible are bringing pe- people back to health and vitality, delivering from the demonic so that they can live full lives. Miracles, therefore, aren't meant to be impressive. If I were Jesus, and if I had Jesus' power, I could think of a whole lot more impressive things to do, don't you? You remember Darth Vader? Does anybody remember Darth Vader? (laughs) Do you remember that thing he used to do where he would get mad and he would start to choke people Like, he'd be across the room, and he'd be like, oh, and all of a sudden, he'd, like, lift them up. I would be doing that. I'm just saying, like, I would be doing that. I would be doing that. I'd be walking on water. I'd be, I would be doing things all the time. I'd essentially be a circus, just walking around doing things. But what, in reality, Jesus did was he never tried to impress people. He tried to restore people. And that's the problem when people are looking for miracles to define God. He's never trying to entertain or impress He's trying to bring people back to vitality and hope. He's trying to give you a vision for your life. He's having you see. He's giving you mental clarity again. He's he's in your mind. He's in your heart. And when we pray for miracles, and just remember this, miracles generally are done in crisis. Maybe you haven't prayed for miracles because simply you're just not in the crisis moment you were once in. Maybe the lack of prayer for miracles is a good thing. But I also believe that miracles are, miracles happen when God goes into an area where there's great darkness and he is trying to reveal himself. That could be on the mission field, that can be in your place of work or where God is trying to let light shine and say, I am real. And so he shows up in restorative moments and in missional moments. But lastly, I wanna end our time because I want you to increase your expectation of miracles. Lastly, miracles happen for those people who let God have the final say. Where everything says no, but you believe God, let's wait to see what God says. When we moved here, we were living in 600 square feet and we had this two-bedroom apartment. And uh, when I lived in the South, I would give people a tour of my home. We would walk upstairs and downstairs. When we moved here, I'd be like, turn your head to the left, <laughs> turn your head to the right, welcome. <laughs> that, was, that was the tour. 600 square feet, and we had two kids at the time. We had a three-year-old and a four-year-old at the time. Paying $2,500 a month for that. Well, we didn't have enough money to even do that. And there came a month where we had about, I would say about $70 in our account. And so we started talking about we're, we need to move. No bridge church, no nothing. And so I was actually in North Carolina trying to raise money. And as I was trying to raise money, my wife texts me and says, baby, when you come back, we probably need to start packing up. And so I text a pastor in Houston. And I said, if you have anything that you could give us this year to support us. We, we just need it. And my prayer was somewhere around $300 would be amazing. Just so we could buy food. But guess what? God had the final say. Would you say that with me? God had the final say. He sent us $30,000. God had the final say. And then from that point on, we started a Bible study and people started coming and God just kept showing up. My Aunt Carolyn 
One day she was in Trader Joe's with uh, my uncle and they were joking around and they're like in their 70s and 80s. And for some reason they decided to, to race to the car. Please, again, this was not a good idea. But they're like one of those cute couples that do things they have no business doing. So she goes to run to the car and all of a sudden she starts to fall back and then sits on the bench. They end up taking her to the hospital. She ends up coding five times. They had to bring her back to life five times. They found all these ulcers in her body. They prepared us for the funeral. And I'll never forget my, my cousin, Tori. I called him up, I just checked in on him, and literally, I was getting ready to ask him, when should we come down? And guess what? God had the final say. He said, oh, no, no, no. We, she may die, but we believe that God has another time, another season for her. We're coming around her, we're praying, and we're fasting, and we're trusting God. I was on the phone with my Aunt Carolyn the other day, just wilding out, acting silly. She is alive. She is alive. She is alive. God had the final say. <laughs> when, I, when I first started walking with the Lord, my mom used to always invite me out to Bible study. And I went one time, and <laughs> when I went to Bible study, they, uh, they saw me there. And it was, you know, it was a church that didn't have a lot of young people. So when I came, it'd be like, hey, brother, you just you a good man. And, all. and you know, they would come to me and like, you, God's, got, God's got something on you. And I'm like, thank you, thank you so much. And so they would come and they would pray over me. And whenever they would pray over me, I would start to cry. But I was like, I can't cry because they might think I want to actually live this out. And I'm going out tonight, you know what I'm saying? So, so I'd be like, hold it, hold it, hold it. I got a lot of foolishness in me still. So, so, uh, so, so, so my mom would go to Bible study and she would say, hey, you coming tonight? No, 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 I'm not coming. And when she would go, I would just go on the block and I would smoke and drink. And one night she was at Bible study and I'm just smoking, I'm just chiefing. There's no, no, nobody's around for those that understand what that means. <laughs> Sorry. I was smoking. <laughs> and, and, as, and I was smoking, um, I literally took a, I took a pull and I said, I just, I just can't stop. I wish I could, but I just cannot stop smoking. I said this to the Lord. A minute later, a swarm of bees come out of nowhere. <laughs> I am telling you the truth. A swarm of bees come out of nowhere. I scream, I run down the block. I'm yelling, I throw the blunt somewhere. I'm like, oh, I'm just doing all this. I look for the blunt for an hour, praise God. Because <laughs> I wasn't delivered yet. <laughs> you know I look for that blunt boy. I look with passion. <laughs> I haven't smoked since that day. That was 25 years ago. And some of you, some of you, some of you are caught up in how you'll change. He'll change you. He'll change you. Invite him in. He'll change you. He delivered me. And he delivered me from so many things. I, I talked about this the other week. I was, a, I, I was a liar. I was uh, going back to school. Uh, I, was at, I was at a junior college. I was going back to school. And um, <clears throat> we, we caught the, this was in Philadelphia um, where I went to junior college. And uh, I went down to Virginia to my four year college. And we had to make it back at a certain time. I was at a military school. We had to make it back at a certain time. And I was with my homeboy. Now my homeboy, he was, uh, he's Muslim. He's about 6'4". Okay, this is important for the story. He's Muslim, he's 6'4", dude. We look nothing alike. We get to the train station, so we gotta get back to Philly at a certain time so that we don't get in trouble in the barracks we're in. We get there and we don't have enough money. And so I tell the woman, hey, I don't know how 
we're gonna do this because we don't have enough money, but we gotta get back in time. She said, the only way that I can get you two tickets is one of you have to be the dad and one of you have to be the son. <laughs> so we get on the train. His name, his, literally his name is Osama. That's his actual name, right? So we get on the train. I am 6'2", he is 6'3", 6'4". We look nothing alike. We're sitting on the train. And the man comes and does your tickets. Tka, tka, tka. So he does my ticket. Tka. He does his ticket. Uh. And he looks at him. And he looks at me. And he looks at him. And he looks at me. And do you know what I said? Big boy, isn't he? <laughs> And do you know one of the knocks against me today is that I'm too honest. God delivered me from lying. Don't you understand? It's not my character, it's deliverance. I believe I had a lying spirit. And when you look back in my, when you look back in my family, I believe that was a curse over my family. You know, a lot of my family are players. We know how to talk the talk. I know how to talk. I know I talk about all types of things. I can talk about all types of things except the truth. And God delivered me from lying. He'll deliver you. Who you are today will not be who you will become. He will change you. You follow him, he changes you. Lastly, <laughs> uh, when we moved here, I needed an office. We had no offices to be out of, and I wanted to work with college students. And uh, some of you know LIU Brooklyn. <laughs> well, I emailed LIU Brooklyn, and I was like, hey, I would love to help out your campus. And so there was a guy named Father Charlie, who was the priest. He responded to my email and said, hey, we don't have a pastor on campus. We would love to have you on the campus. And so all of a sudden, I got another email from a guy named Rabbi Josh. And Rabbi Josh, it, he is obviously the rabbi. He emails me and says, it would be so good to have a pastor, a priest, and a rabbi. So then they, they all email me back. We set up a meeting. So it sounds like a joke, right? The priest, the rabbi, and the pastor. So, so they set up a, so then I, I meet with the assistant dean. And they said, this woman will love you because she is a Christian. So I sit down with her and I say, hey, I hear you guys don't have a pastor. I would love to be the pastor on campus. Plus, I don't have any people. I don't have an office. But I didn't say this. I just wanted to, you know, help out the campus. <laughs> this woman said, first of all, I did not email you. They emailed you. So I was like, the meeting's not going well. <laughs> She said, we don't need a pastor because if we get a pastor, we'll need an imam for the Muslims. We don't need all that. We, we're good with who we have. I'm sitting there like, you say it? You know the Lord? This is the Christian. So I sit there and I'm just like, okay. Little did I know, the rabbi emailed her boss and set up a meeting for me next week. So I said, I, let me just go meet with this man because I have nothing else to do. So I, I go and I meet with him. His name was Dean Agnelli. I go into the meeting expecting the same thing I got from the Christian woman. I sit there and I say, uh, yeah, I would just love to help out your campus, be a pastor. This man starts in and goes, sir, we have so much going on. I oversee eight different departments. We already have a rabbi, we already have a priest. And then he takes his computer screen and he turns it towards me. And he says, look at all these things I oversee. I'm doing too much. I don't know what we can do. And so I see under campus ministry, it said Father Charlie on his, on his org chart. It said Father Charlie. Underneath Father Charlie, it said Rabbi Josh. And underneath Rabbi Josh, it said Pastor James. Now I'm sitting there staring at this thing right in front of this man as he's telling me we don't have room for you on campus. So I said, no problem. Could I just ask you one question? Who's Pastor James? And do you know what this man said? I don't know how that got there. And I said, me neither. But I am a pastor and my name is James. 
In fact, I am Pastor James. So he calls in his secretary, Monica, come here. How'd this get her? She's like, and they started an argument right there. I said, guys, no need to argue. You don't need to remove it. I just can help out the campus. He's like, well, how about we give you an office and we give you a parking space and you just become the campus pastor? I was like, okay. <laughs> You can't tell me God is not a miracle worker. And here's what I want you to build up your confidence. When everyone says no, God, wait till what God has to say. I don't care if it's rent or health. I don't care if it's jobs or people. Wait for God's answer. Give God the final say. Believe in him for the mundane and you will see God do the miraculous, expect it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We ask you, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in Jesus' name, amen? amen. Would you stand with me? Okay, just a second. As I was speaking, some of you may have felt a pull on your heart, not just in terms of miracles, but in the reality of wanting more of God in your life. Now, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in relationship with him, he is leading your life, then we pray that you would just grow. But some of you, under the sound of my voice, at this point, in this moment, in this season of your life, you have been trying to lead your own life and you have not given Jesus the leadership over your decisions, the leadership over your relationship, the leadership over your finances. He is not the leader of your life. And what the Bible calls that is making him Lord. It is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, not just for things, but for your whole life. And this afternoon, I want to offer you an opportunity to make Jesus Lord. That's why we come together as a church, because we want to offer people an understanding of who God is, but we also want to offer them leadership. All the things that I'm talking about today are not just about knowing Jesus knowing about Jesus rather. First, we must be, begin with knowing Jesus and making him the leader of our life, making him the Lord of your life. Is there one today, we'd love to, for you to come to the front, we will celebrate you, we will walk with you. Do not be afraid, do not wrestle. Come today, today, today. It doesn't matter if you've come before, if you do not feel like Jesus is the Lord of your life, come, come celebrate my sister. God bless you, God bless you. Is there, is there another? Today, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wrestle with it. Don't argue with him. Surrender. Surrender. Lay, just lay down. Just decide today, I will surrender my life to you. I want to give you the leadership of my life. Is there another? that today is the day you wanna give Jesus the leadership of your life. Don't worry about if you'll make mistakes, you will, I guarantee it. He'll change you. Amen, 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 amen. Is there another that you want today, you are, you are worried, you are concerned, you are fearful about how you'll look, no, get, who is looking at you? The Lord is. And he is calling you today to come back to him. Some of you have been with the Lord. You've been around the Lord, but you are afraid that you'll make mistakes again. I'm telling you, you need people in your life investing in you, walking with you. You cannot do the Christian life on your own. This is another today that you want Jesus to be the leader of your life and you want to begin today. Is there another? 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 Would we celebrate our sisters here today? God bless you. God bless you. You're gonna go with Pastor Josh right here. Okay. God bless you.